Hey guys, Mr. Hyatt here. This is the chapter 15 lecture on uh, chromosomal basis of inheritance. So uh, just to kind of put things into perspective, 1866, Mendel works out his, his uh, ideas on genetics. Then about 10 years later, 1875, we work out mitosis. Another 15 years later, we work out meiosis. 1902, uh, Sutton is able to connect chromosomes to meiosis that says that uh, things like chromosomes are going to segregate and follow Mendel Mendel's laws, not genes. So genes can sometimes violate independent assortment if they live on the same chromosome. Here's a picture of chromosomes where genes have specific addresses. Uh, if we apply uh, Mendel's ideas with the, his breeding pattern with the parental ge uh, generation, the first fill and the second fill of generations. We apply meiosis to those types of things. Look at how well the math works out. Now we know in nature it never works out as nice and clean as that, but uh, it really makes the math work, which suggests that it is in fact the chromosomes that sort independently and not the genes themselves. Uh, so Morgan is uh, kind of one of these world famous scientists that uh, chose he tested fruit flies. Every person that learns biology at the collegiate level learns about Morgan and Drosophila mel melanogaster. Uh, but it allowed the first, basically, let us find the first addresses of genes on chromosomes. You see on this slide we've got the male and the female. Uh, you can see the color pattern is a little bit different. The wings are a little bit different. Um, but why did we, why did Morgan choose uh, fruit flies, or specifically Drosophila melanogaster. Well, they're small. You've seen a fruit fly. They're tiny, cheap and easy to feed. Uh, they have short generation time. They don't live very long. They have a lot of offspring. And they have a few chromosomes. So if you're trying to find the address of a chromosome for the first time, it makes sense to start with a simplistic uh, organism. Unfortunately, for most bio students, uh, this the notation is tricky. Okay, so Mendel uses big T, little t. We're all real comfortable with that. We're probably less comfortable uh, with uh, Morgan's notation of wild type. So just bear with me for a minute. I think it'll make sense once we get through uh, this example. Okay, so uh, here we've got a recessive mutation. So little w is white eyes, little w plus is red eyes. In case of a dominant mutation, cy is curly, cy plus is normal. So the plus is the wild phenotype. And that wild type term basically means that that's what most wild animals have, which is pretty much how we came up with dominant and recessive. So they're, they're synonyms kind of. So here's an example. Morgan observed a, a male fly with, a, with white eyes and uh, he crossed them with a normal red-eyed female. So again, that, that red eye is the wild type. So, so we would call that dominant if we were uh, Mendel. So when we crossed the red-eyed female, I'm sorry, the red-eyed male, <coughs> no, I said that wrong, red-eyed female and the white-eyed male, all the offspring had red eyes. That suggests that it's a genetic recessive. He expected the F2 to have a 3 to 1 ratio. But look at that with the white-eyed males being, or the white-eyed flies all being male. So now all of a sudden we've got eye color being linked to sex or gender. So that's where these sex-linked tra traits come in. You, you guys worked on some sex-linked uh, Punnett squares and some things like that uh, just a few days ago. So there are fruit fly chromosomes. You see the, those loci marked on the left side, and there's only... So there are the two uh, loci, that's a locus location. Uh, and in females, they only have one copy, I'm sorry, in males, they only have one copy of that. Sort of like male pattern baldness or color blindness uh, in humans. Here's our, our image of that mapped out. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to sex link traits in humans here in just a second. So there are uh, Morgan made the connection that there are a whole bunch of genes but only a few chromosomes. So genes must be carried uh, carried around on chromosomes. Of course that connects that links that, that genes are linked. So independent assortment doesn't work at the gene level. It works at the chromosomal level. Uh, crazy enough the, these ratios are going to mimic monohybrid crosses when we cross chromosomes. 
So here's our body color and wing type cross. You see here is parental generation, F1. We get the dominant phenotypes. We crossbreed again. We get a 3 to 1 ratio uh, of all the different traits, surprisingly enough. If they were unlinked, it'd be a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. Remember, the plus is the wild type. So that's what most organisms are, and that's what most organisms are. And this would be uh, all recessives, right? So there's our test cross. Um, yeah, again, don't, don't forget about that test cross term uh, from the last unit, but check out our ratios down here. If it was a 1 to 1 to 1, we would expect all of the, the phenotypes to have 575. We don't see that. We see 9 to 3 to 1. And then you throw in recombination with crossing over, and this stuff gets really interesting and really difficult to predict. <clears throat> so uh, we can use our recombination frequency to figure out how close to genes might be. Uh, our recombination frequency, you can see, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, so notice that these are parental type offspring, so that uh, they match. They've got a red and a blue, and they've got a pink and a blue. Over here, we've got the recombinant DNA, so that's where we've got red, pink, uh, blue, pink, red, blue. So we've had a crossing over event. We total those, divide them by the uh, total number of offspring, make it a percentage. That shows us that our recombination frequency is 17%. Think about when you played Red Rover as a little kid. If you're right next to each other, you don't have a very good chance of being split up. But if you're on opposite ends of the, uh, the line or whatever you call that in Red Rover, you have a really good chance of getting split up. That's basically what we're trying to figure out here. If you have a 17% chance of being split up, you're relatively far apart. If you had a 90% chance of being split up, that means you're really far apart. Don't forget about crossing over from uh, meiosis. We, we've learned a ton of this. Um, linkages may be strong or weak, kind of like I talked about, the degree of strength. Uh, think of Red Rover there. We use these crossing over percentages to build our addresses. We say one map unit is one recombination frequency, so, or 1%. So that 17% that we saw in that last example, they would be 17 map units apart. Once we map a bunch of these different traits that we can find on the same chromosome, we can piece together uh, a decent map. Notice this right here. Only works for genes that are within 50 map units of each other because if you get greater than 50%, it's really, really difficult to identify are these two linked or are they, um, are they on different chromosomes? The, the math just becomes difficult. Um, many of these have been cr uh, constructed for fruit flies. We have a few in humans uh, and, and certainly other organisms as well. Uh, but you see, we've got this map uh, of this chromosome. I think this is, I can't remember which chromosome this is. Um, but we, we've got this long, uh, the, the basically antenna on the head, the gray body, the body uh, color, the eye color, the wings, the type of wings, uh, and then the color of eyes, they're all on the same chromosome. We use crossing over frequencies uh, to map them apart. Now notice that this is 67, that's 104, that's greater than 100. On a few slides ago I said that we map them within 50 map units of each other. Well, these two are within 50 of each other. These two are within 50 of each other. These two are within 50 of each other. And these two are within 50 of each other. So we can go A to B to C to D to E, and we can figure out linkages. It's tough to go from A to D and figure out linkages. So um, that, that I apologize, uh, that social insects thing is a link. Uh, I posted this on Canvas so you can use it. Um, there, these are the sex uh, systems uh, that, that we're aware of. Um, so mammals, you're familiar with that. Diploid insects uh, do X and XX, so they, they don't have a Y. They just have an inactive 
uh, or a missing chromosome in uh, males. And then birds use diff a different notation, ZZ and ZW. <clears throat> so here we see uh, th these are those insects, uh, 22 uh, plus meaning uh, wild type. So 22 plus X is a male, XX is a female, uh, 76 ZW, uh, ZZ, again, female, male. And then uh, this would be a, a haploid uh, insect. Uh, again, you can click on that link and learn more about those. That That's kind of, I don't want to get lost in the weeds in, in that system, um, but if you are someone who wants to go on and study bees or you want to go on and study uh, insects in college, make sure you check into that. Uh, notice that males are have half the DNA uh, that, that females have. So that may help you understand why only the queen mates and, and some things like that. So in humans, uh, we've got the X chromosome that's decently sized. It's not as long as chromosome 1, but it is certainly longer than, than the Y chromosome. Here in a few slides, I'll, I'll show you uh, a chromosomal map. Uh, here is uh, a 3D image of the X and the Y. You can see there are drastically different sizes. We know males are XY, females are XX. Uh, they are a homologous pair, but only for a small region. So here we've got our karyotype. Notice that the two X's are roughly the same size, not exactly the same size, but roughly the same size, and they do have the same banding pattern. When we get to the Y, notice where we put the Y chromosome down here. We line it up down here, not because we're OCD about things being at the bottom left, but because that's where it's homologous with the X chromosome. Notice all this space up here where there's just not a homologous copy of uh, the X chromosome. That's where traits like hemophilia and color blindness and, and those types of things uh, are uh, are located on the X. So uh, most people call this sorry, sex determining region of the Y chromosome. Uh, if it's present, you're a male. If it's absent, you're a female biologically, uh, which essentially codes for a cell receptor. Now, take a guess as to what that cell receptor receives talking about something that determines gender. So I leave that for you to sort of think about and process on your own. Uh, so uh, X linkage is somewhat common. Uh, y linkage is very rare. Um, it, it appears that it exists, but we're not 100% sure. Uh, so we're hemizygous, we're me, males. We are hemizygous, which means we have one copy of the X chromosome. Uh, hemi, think hemisphere, half the sphere. Uh, we show all the X traits, dominant or recessive, and we're more likely to show recessive X problems or recessive X traits than our females because females have a chance to have a second X that covers it up. Um, we're going to talk in class specifically about colorblindness. That's one that affects my family tree, so we'll walk, walk through that process. But hemophilia A and B, immune system defects, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, these are all X-linked disorders. Hem uh, yeah, hemophilia is on there. So... Um, here are some examples of X-link patterns. Uh, like I said, we'll talk through this whole thing in, in pretty good detail uh, in class. So I, I think you'll understand that. So X-link patterns, the trait is usually pa passed from a carrier mother to half of her sons. Uh, an affected father has no affected children, but passes the trait on to all daughters who will be carriers for the trait. If that doesn't make sense, map out the Punnett square. Apply the Punnett square to a pedigree. Once you logic your way through it once, it'll make sense. So again, we'll do that same exact process uh, in my family, uh, and we'll look specifically at colorblindness. So um, watch how the questions uh, are phrased. Am I asking about children in general, or am I asking about uh, males specifically? So uh, that's one way that, that you can kind of be tripped up here. Last but not least, can a female be colorblind? Absolutely. Can a female have male pattern baldness? Absolutely. Can she be hemophilic? Absolutely. If mom was a carrier and dad had it. So uh, I'll leave off here. I'll pick up with some Y, uh, y linkage uh, in part two.